بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونؤذي له من شر انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له نشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد to you my beloved brother imam nuruddin and our beloved brother imam raid and others to all of the fathers and husbands and mothers and wives i greet you assalamu alaikum i'm asking allah the almighty to bless us this evening to say to you some words to add to the greatness of this conference today i pray that when you go home tonight that you will be better than when you came all of the muslims who reach adulthood they get married they have children it is their dream that their children would grow up as muslims and die as muslims allah has blessed me over the years with nine wonderful children I don't mind telling you that if my son or daughter became a doctor I would be very proud of them but I must be honest I wouldn't mind if my son would be a garbage collector and sweep trash in New York City if he died a muslim my real pr- pride is for my children to live their lives and to die as muslims so what make me different whatever they became if they just died a muslim it means nothing to become a doctor to become a lawyer to become a judge it means nothing if you become a doctor a lawyer a judge and lose your religion we don't want muslim children to grow up simply to be professionals to have a lot of money to have a lot of education if that education doesn't lead them to be closer to Allah the Almighty and so tonight i like to talk about our future imam nuruddin once a good friend of mine told me he said siraj you should pray as if everything depends on Allah whatever you want pray as if everything depends upon Allah and it does but he said imam you should work as if everything depends on you and it really doesn't pray as if everything depends on Allah and it does but you can't stop there you have to work as if everything depends only on you and it really doesn't tonight 
I would like to paint to you two pictures of our future. Which one would it be? Where will the vision come from? What is your vision of the future? You who have a baby three years old, when your child is 23, what will they be doing? You young brother that I ate dinner with, 20 years old, looking to get married, 20 years from now, your children, what would Florida be like? What would Fort Lauderdale look like? Miami, Orlando, what would it look like? What will America look like? It could be one of two. It is possible that 20 years from now there'll be 20, 30, 40, 50 million Muslims in America. There's a possibility that in the city of Fort Lauderdale, 20 years from now, there'll be 10 full-time Muslim schools. There's a possibility that every other business that you see in Fort Lauderdale or Miami or, or Jacksonville, Florida, or New York City, maybe every other store owned by a Muslim. Maybe 20 years from now, we'll have a magazine that could compete with Time Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, USN, US uh, News and World Report. Maybe 20 years from now, you turn on the TV set, instead of seeing Nightline with Bill Koppel, you see a program that Muhammad is the producer and the guest. Maybe by then we'll have our own television stations all throughout America. Maybe 20 years from now, we go to the international airport and we'll see planes owned by Muslims to fly five plane loads of Muslims to Mecca for Hajj from this city. Maybe 20 years from now, we'll look around and see so many Muslim women wearing hijab all over the place, long flowing dresses. Maybe 20 years from now, we can walk the street at night, our sisters, if they wanted to walk the street at night and not be afraid of being molested in even some of the major cities. Maybe 20 years from now, we will see great progress among Muslims. Could be like that. But on the other hand, there's a possibility that 20 years from now, some of the Muslims that you know today be out of hijab. Maybe 20 years from now, some of these young Muslim boys and girls that we see now, maybe some of them will be in jail. 20 years from now, maybe we won't have 20, 30, or 50,000, a million Muslims in America. Maybe we'll have 5 million Muslims in America. What will the future be? Only Allah knows. Therefore, my message today comes from an incident that took place 1,400 years ago. A man came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Mata Sa'a, Mata Sa'a. And he asked the question that everybody want to know the answer to. Mata Sa'a, when is the day of judgment? This is a crucial question. If we knew that tomorrow would be the day of judgment, would that not impact upon our conduct today? I guarantee you, if we knew that tomorrow the day of judgment, we act differently tonight when we go home 
then we would think in that judgment is some 500, 5 million years from now, wouldn't we? So he asked a good question. Matasah. When is the day of judgment? Now the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, could have answered many ways. He could have said that no one knows the hour except Allah. And this would be the right answer. But rather our messenger answered a way to me shows his great wisdom as a teacher. He says, Ma laha. He asks this man, what did you prepare for the day of judgment? You see, brothers and sisters, the question is not what will the future be like for Muslims in North America 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 2,000 years from now. The question is not what the future will bring. Only Allah knows. But the real question is what preparation have we made to make sure that this future will be a future that we can be proud of? I'm saying to you today, that the fruits that we will reap tomorrow is based on the seeds we plant today. And if you don't plant the right seed, you're not going to reap the fruits. And if you plant the wrong seed, you will root, root, uh, reap the harvest of destruction. So therefore, I would like to talk today for the next few moments about our preparation for the future. We have a problem. The problem that we have is that everybody have in their own mind the vision of the Muslims in North America. What will it look like? And if you ask each brother and each sister, then what vision do you have of tomorrow? Then you may, be, you may see that sometimes the visions are diverse. Maybe some Muslims have the vision of a total emergence into the American mainstream. Maybe in the minds of some Muslims, they want to be so separated from the, from the American people, so segregated from the American people, and in their mind, the vision is the vision of separation and segregation. And on the other hand, some may have the vision of total immersing in integration into the American mainstream. So the first question we have is what is the vision of the Muslims for the future? And where will that vision come from? If you have vision, you must be able to see. Last week when I was in Fort Lauderdale, I gave those present the example of a seed. That when the average person looks at a seed, the average person doesn't know what that seed will become because it's too embryonic. You can't recognize it. But there are some people yet who are able to recognize a seed because of their experience. They know what that seed will become. But yet, when you plant the seed, and then the seed begins to grow, the more it begins to grow, more people are able to recognize it but not everybody. And when the seed grow more and more and more and the more it grows, the more people will be able to recognize it. And even still, some people can't. But when that seed becomes a tree and it begins to bear fruit, most everybody says, oh, I know what this, that's an apple tree because it's bearing fruit, but there's some people, Imam, that are so blind that even when the tree produces apples, they still can't see because they're blind. There are some people now who can look at America and know that the direction in which America is going is going to produce some fruit that's destructive for these people. And there are some people so gullible, so happy to be in America, so wonderful America, if I can just get me a green card, 
Oh, by the way, I'm not speaking about anybody here. Everybody here is straight. I'm talking about the other people. Yes. You have to know what the dream is, what the vision is. Because you're going to have to do some work in order to whatever your dream is, whatever your aspiration is, you're going to have to do some work, whatever it is. And I'm here to say today, my point is that whatever you think the dream or whatever you hope for, you're not going to get it simply because you hope for it. The only way you're going to get it is by praying to Allah for it and then go working for it. وَلَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَسَعَى Man can have nothing except for what they strive for. So you have to strive in order to get it to fulfill this dream. I was driving my car down Linden Boulevard in Brooklyn. And I stopped at a light on Nostrand Avenue. I'm sorry, it was on Eastern Parkway. And I stopped at a light on, you know what's at. One morning after Fajr. And as I sat there waiting for the light to turn, I noticed a blind man being escorted across the street in front of me by a woman. And she was escorting him and she took him across the street and she took him down the subway. And as uh, the light turned and I began to drive my car, I kept thinking about that blind man. I said, you know what? I tried to imagine myself not being able to see. Couldn't drive my car. Even I couldn't dress myself unless somebody helped me. And even if you're trying to dress yourself, you don't know what you look like. Maybe you put clothes on, you have clothes, and you feel yourself, and you put shoes on, you put clothes on, but you don't know what you look like. You don't know because you're unable to see, so you have to trust somebody. Somebody had to come and dress him and help him to get dressed and help him across the street because if he didn't trust somebody, they can take him across the street when the light is green rather than when the light is red and he can get hit by a car. So I was thinking what it's like to be blind and how thankful that I am that I can see and how thankful to Allah that we should be because we can see, because we are so ungrateful to Allah, always asking for something. I'm up there, give me that, give me that, give me that. But yet something so basic like the ability to see, we don't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. And then I started thinking, there's a radio program that comes on in New York City on WABC radio program. And there's a news commentator called Paul Harvey. And he has a news commentary that's called uh, um, The Other, The Rest of the Story. Who said that? Yeah, there you go. See, I'm not making this stuff up. It's called The Rest of the Story. And what he usually does is he gives some story, some person that we know, but then he gives details about the life of the person that we don't know. It's called the rest of the story. I discovered the rest of the story about a man that I became very fond of. A man by the name of Abdullah ibn Um Maktoum. He was a man that was born blind in Mecca, in the very early stages of the mission of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One day the Messenger of Allah was talking to, trying to invite to Islam Abu Jahl and all the other arrogant uh, Quraysh. And here come Abdullah ibn uh, Umm Maktoum trying to talk to the Prophet, trying to ask him some questions. Well, and he turned and frowned. He frowned and turned away. The 80th surah of the Quran, Abasa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
because a blind man came to you. And the blind person came and the Messenger of Allah was so concerned about giving da'wah to these people that he frowned and turned away from this man, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. You know by now that this person became Muslim became a Sahaba. This is the same person that the Prophet والسلام, when he told his companions to make the Salat in the house, in the masjids, he came and said that I'm a blind and I, I can't see, I can't, I, I have no one to guide me to go to the masjid. Can I make my Salat in the house? And the Prophet said, yes. And when he turned away, the Prophet said, can you hear the adhan? He said, yes. He said, respond to it. Fajib. So Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum had to make his salat in the masjid every day with the rest of the men among the Muslims. So this man whom the Prophet turned away from took shahada, became great sahaba, made his salat in the masjid. Rest of the story is that he himself became one of the mu'addins of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salat was salam. Him and Bilal ibn Rabah became great mu'addin. And so when someone told him that the time was in, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, this man Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum called the Adhan. Now, brothers and sisters, for the rest of the story. Allah revealed in the Quran, not alike of those who sit at home and those mujahideen of Fisabilillah and those who fight in the way of Allah, not equal. All of them have their reward for Allah, but those who go out and fight in the way of Allah has more reward than those that sit at home. And then when that ayat was revealed, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum came to the Prophet complaining to him. He says, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, if I had the ability to fight jihad, I would fight. And so because of that, Allah revealed in that same ayat, Allah added something as a result of Abdullah. Allah added, except those who have some disability. So those who have disability, they get the same reward as those who went out. Now let me tell you the end of the story. When Umar ibn Khattab became the Khalifa, there was a battle against the Persians in the 14th year of Hijjah. And Umar called for everybody, every man who can carry a sword to fight this big battle for the Muslims. And Abdullah ibn Salam, uh, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, he came to Umar and said, Ya Amiru Mu'mineen, let me carry the standard. Let me carry the flag. I'm blind and I can't run away. And let me hold it, and I will hold the standard or die. And there was a great battle. The Muslims won a great battle. But the price was heavy casualties. And among all the hundreds that have died was the man, the Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. They found him on the battlefield with the flag in his hand. Allah made his words true. If I could fight in the way of Allah, I would. And this man, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, became for us a great example for Muslims today of a man who had the right spirit of Islam. Now, brothers and sisters, what do I say all of this and what does it have to do with the future of Muslims in America? In my conclusion, 
to me, the Muslims in America are some of the most educated Muslims around the world. If I ask just this audience, how many of you have either been to college or the universities or have graduated from colleges or universities or are attending right now, raise your hand. Raise them up high. Look around. Look around, brothers and sisters. The Muslim Ummah doesn't lack education. If you would compare this Ummah now to 1400 years ago, we couldn't compare, could we? They don't know the sciences that you study. Many of them couldn't read or write. The Prophet والسلام, said that this is uh, an unlettered ummah. They couldn't even calculate the days of even Ramadan. You were able mathematically to predict 10,000 years from now when a new moon would come because you are that educated. But even though we have more education than them, we certainly don't more have more good knowledge than them. We have their education here, but we don't have their knowledge there. The thing that I would like to leave this community and in this city with two things. Number one, knowledge, but not just any kind of knowledge. I believe that our parents have made great sacrifices in this city to put your children in higher education. But I think we have to look again and ask ourselves, did we put them in the right education? Last week when I was here, I told you that in New York City, I read an article in the New York Post entitled, The Rise of Islam in New York City. An article said that there are 100,000 Muslim students in New York City going to public school. And while we have 17 full-time Muslim schools, but those 17 full-time Muslim schools only serviced some 5% of the Muslim youth in New York City. That has to change. Question to you and me today, what have you prepared for our future? I remember reading that the Prophet said once there was a wolf who went and took a sheep and started running. And when the wolf took the sheep and started running, then the shepherd started running after the wolf. And when the shepherd was running after the wolf, this hadith, this Bukhari hadith, volume number uh, four under MBI, the section, the prophets, in the end of that is this hadith. And so the shepherd was running after the wolf with the sheep in his mouth. And then the wolf turned around and set up and said, what will you do in the day of wild beasts when there would be no shepherd other than me. The day of wild beast, when there will be no shepherd other than me. If we lose these, our youth, don't blame the wolf for eating the sheep. Blame the shepherd for not guarding the sheep. Question, how many of you know Muslims who used to practice, used to make prayer, 
used to dress as a Muslim woman, used to come to the masjid, and no longer. Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Come on, be honest. Raise them up. Look around. Look around. I want you to look around. How many know more than one who used to? How many know more than two that used to? Look around. How many know more than three that used to? How many know more than four that used to? Hands are still up. How many know more than five that used to? How many know more than six that used to? How many know more than seven that used to? How many know more than eight that used to? How many know more than nine that used to? When will it end? How many know more than 10 that used to? How many know more than 11 that used to? Hands are still up. How many know more than 12 that used to? I better put your hands down. Is that enough for you? Is that enough? Or do we need more? Is it enough for a brother to come to me and say, Brother Imam Saraj, I just found out that a woman I was just married to has the AIDS virus, Muslim, is it enough to know that a sister comes and say, Imam, I've been married to a brother over 20 years and he has no other wife than me and I have not been un unfaithful to him but yet I have such and such disease? Is it enough for that? The bottom line is, what will we do about it? I've said over the years that brothers and sisters, you, you parents, you have to know your children because all of our children are not alike. They're all different. I have some children that I believe that I can put them anywhere and they'll thrive. But then I have some other children. I don't think I could do that. I remember years ago, my young son, um, Saraj, he was young then. I can talk about him. He was years ago. It was during the month of Ramadan. And you know what I do when I I would be in the master during the day, I would go home to see how the kids are doing, how the fast is doing. And I remember one day, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I called home. And I spoke to my daughter, Hudra. Hudra answered the phone. I said, how's everything? Everything is fine. I said, put your brother on the phone. So Siraj comes on the phone, and the first thing he says, I wasn't going to eat it. <laughs> Siraj, you weren't going to eat what? That toast that I just made. By the way, Siraj is fasting. I wasn't going to eat it. I'm saving it for iftar. <laughs> so you see, as you begin to develop your children, you have to know your children because all of them are different. And you have to be careful. Some of your children you can put in a public school and they'll do fine. Some of them. But many of them, if you put them in a public school, you're going to lose them. And what I just said, you have to be honest with yourself to realize that many of them, if you put in a public school, you're going to lose them. Why do you think people still raising their hand? I know 10 people, 12 people, 11 Muslims, 13 Muslims, 15 Muslims who used to practice, don't practice anymore. What happened to you? I think what happened to them is somebody fell asleep, the guardian fell asleep, and the, and the wolf came and took them away. And I'm telling you, America are full of wolves. All over America, there are wolves waiting for our little sheep. And let me tell you the prize. You want me to tell you the prize? Do you want me to tell you the prize? The prize are these Muslim women, pure, raised up, pure. Our prize. She goes to school. She goes to college. Salaikum salam, sister. And then what? We lose this precious, our future, and the mother of our future. We lose them because we didn't have the foresight of how to protect them. 
I don't say don't send them to college. I don't say don't send them. But if you're going to send them, you better protect them. If you can't protect them, you better not send them. You didn't hear what I just said. I'm not saying don't send them to college, but if you're going to send them, you better protect them. And if you can't protect them, you better not send them. So brothers and sisters, our future, the youth, it depends a lot on what we do. The key, planning. This morning I flew on a little plane and I wish you could have heard the people, the passengers. Man, we hit an air pocket and went, Ooh. ah! People were screaming, Imam, the plane was rocking and the people were screaming, ah! ah! Everybody had taco this morning. You, you want to know what taqwa is? God consciousness? Fear of Allah? Get in the plane and hit an air pocket. And you know what it is. You ever been on a plane? I was on the plane, you know, and I was looking around. And I was looking in the cockpit. And I was watching the pilot as he was flying. And all those mechanisms. You ever see it? It must be something to fly a plane. All of these things, all these instruments, all these things, and you know, you have to do everything. And I looked at the wings, I looked, all of that magnificent planning. And you know, when the plane lands, you notice how the people come to get the luggage, and they know exactly where to take it because everything is tagged. You know, they said the plane is gonna take off at three o'clock. It takes off at three o'clock, not like the Muslims. Oh, by the way, not these Muslims here. No. <laughs> Planning. A plane. Timing, scheduling. Techniques, ability, skill, training, learning. Instruments, tools. Planning. And I said, you know what? Look at any plane. Look at any plane, P-L-A-N-E, look at any plane, and you see in the plane, planning. Three years from, uh, three years from uh, last month in November, I, Imam, I, I have to honest, I, I'm gonna show off, I'm gonna show off now. Imam, I flew on a, on a Concorde. You, Imam, you ever fly on a con Concorde? I didn't think so. You ever fly on a Concorde? I don't think so. You, 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 few of you, maybe one or two. Who ever flew in the Concorde? All right, all right, one. <laughs> and you know what? I made it from New York JFK to Heathrow in three hours. Used these seven hours. That plane was moving. Thousand miles per hour. A plane, a jet plane. That's planning. Had on the plane passengers. Big planes, 500 passengers. And Imam, usually when you go on a long trip, you take food with you because people get hungry on the plane. And that takes planning. So the, um, uh, the stewardess. She comes out and she gives water, and she gives you know, food, and she gives this plane. And then the higher up you go in the atmosphere, you need the oxygen in the plane. That takes planning. Some skillful mind has to learn how to take the plane up, how to fly it, how to guide it, to carry the food, and you have to carry the enough fuel so that you can get from one place to the other. That's a plane, P-L-A-N-E, that's a plane. It takes planning. But there's another plane that I like to talk about for a moment. It's not called plane, but planet. P-L-A-N-E-T. 
This plane called planet also take a lot of planning. So this plane travels 1,137,000 1, miles per minute. We on it right now, moving, flying to space. Can you feel it? Right now, we Right now, and you sitting down, some sleeper, and this plane is moving. This plane has 500 passengers. This plane has 6 billion passengers. This plane carries food. This plane grows its own food. This plane carries water. This plane has 137,965,000 square miles of water. This plane goes up in the sky, and you gotta have the oxygen. This plane has its own oxygen around it. It floats to the sky. If this plane takes planet, what about this plane called the planet made by Allah, the great planet? Allah's great, who there says that Allah doesn't exist? You fool. Planning. I learned the lesson that by the permission of Allah, men and women make things happen. Don't wish for it. Don't hope for it. Strive to get it. You want to make a brilliant future? The leadership must come together and plan. You know the great lesson I learned from school all my years of schooling? One of the greatest lessons that I learned, you have to do your homework. Yes. I love to do homework. I teach a class. I have about 70 students. And I told them that they didn't know that. But I give a one hour talk, 15 hours of preparation for one hour talk. All they see is the teacher talking, but they don't see the hours of preparation. I sometimes pray to Allah, oh Allah, how am I gonna deliver this to the students? How am I gonna make the students understand? What examples can I give them? Planning! Because I want the students to learn. I want them to get the message. So you gotta plan. 1978, I was blessed to be in Mecca in my conclusion, I'm finished. 1978, I was blessed to be in Mecca. Only four months. I only had a couple of courses. But can I tell you what my schedule was? Young brothers and sisters, I would go to bed every night. In Mecca, I was in, in um, King Abdulaziz University at the time. I would go to bed each night around 10 o'clock at night, or maybe 10.30. All the brothers were up. Late at night, I would go to bed 10 o'clock every night. And when all the brothers would sleep, at about 3 o'clock in the morning, I would go to the masjid by myself. The students gave me a key. We had a masjid in the college campus, and they gave me a key. And I would go into that masjid 3 o'clock in the morning. I would pray, and I would read the Quran. And then when the rest of the brothers came for Salat, we had Salat to Fajr. And then everyone left but one brother. One of the students there, he sat down with me and made me read behind him. So he corrected me. And then after that, he would go, I would lock up the masjid. You know what I did? Right next to the masjid was a track field. Track. And I had my sneakers on. And I would run track every morning. It's after Fajr. I would run. What you doing, Suraj? I'm training. What you training for? Soon I'm going back to America. And I have some work to do. But I want to be prepared. I want to train myself so that when I go back, I'll be prepared. So after I ran track, I went to our dorm, I took a shower, and by the time I took a shower, the brothers woke up. 
Where did I go? I didn't go to breakfast. I went to the class and sat in front of the classroom going over my notes while the brothers went and ate breakfast. Every, this is every morning. And when it was over, those four months, I got so much because I was preparing myself to go back here to America to work. Making dua to Allah, Allah help me. Help me to learn this message. Help me to learn this so that I can teach it to others. So I got so much out of the four months because of preparation. I close now with this. Imams, principals of schools, school teachers, the challenge. What vision do we have for tomorrow? If you want more schools in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, why not sit together with the leadership seriously and say, in the next five years, we want five new schools and what will it take? That's planning. You see, wise people plan and they know and they have to respond to all of the conditions that happen, whatever the conditions are. If we raise our hand and said so many people left the Islam, question, what is our response? The leadership have to sit down now and plan what are we going to do to save them. I say to you as individuals, don't think about what the Imam has to do. First ask yourself, what do you have to do? Because maybe, maybe among, among those that left, some are our own children. You know what a great scholar once told me? He says, Imam Siraj, I was thinking about my son and how much my son knows now compared to how much he knows. And he says, Imam Siraj, I can truthfully say that my son only knows 5% of what I knew in his age. Then another Imam told me recently, he says, Imam Siraj, I come to the conclusion that if we can save just one of our children, we would have done something magnificently. Isn't that a sad commentary? He's got a whole bunch of children. He said, if I can just save one of them, I want to save all of them. I want to save all nine of my children. And I want you to save all of your children. But you have to ask yourself the question, what plan do you have? For some of you, I'll tell you outright, if you know the condition of your children, you know your children, wallahi, it is better to put them on a plane and go back somewhere, to somewhere they can practice their deen, rather than to leave them here and you know they're losing their deen. It's better to be poor and go back. I know what you're saying, I heard you. Where are we gonna go back to? Believe me, some places, are much better than this. They may not have all the luxurious things that America has, but inshallah, at least they'll be able to practice their deen. This is the choice that we have. Three choices, as I conclude. One, stay in America and be so influenced by the forces of America and lose our deen. I read an article that scared me in the Times newspaper two years ago. They talked about the new European Islam and the American Islam, which means no Islam. Choice number one, stay here, be influenced by them. Choice number two, leave here and go migrate somewhere like the prophet made Hydra. A viable alternative. Or number three, stay in America and then transform the environment suitable for us so that we and others can in fact stay here. That's the choice. I think we can do three. I think we can do three if we plan. But it must be collective. More about that in the 
without the session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you brothers and sisters and bless your parents, bless your leaders, and bless us with the wisdom to have a plan and the strength to follow the plan. Jazakallah khairan. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.